This is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, uh, welcoming you tonight to our study on the book of Revelation. Last week we began in the section, remember this book is divided into, into three sections according to John chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 19, the things that John saw, the things that are, and we're in the the things that John saw was the was the glorified uh, Christ. Uh, the things that are is the church age that we're in, and in the things that shall come hereafter. So we're now in the things that are of the church, and these churches are all historic churches found in John's day. But we'll also see that each of these types of churches fits the whole sweep of church history with one type of church, the most dominant uh, at some period of time. So the prophetic scope of these letters is what's most important for us today. There are historical churches in his day, but what does it mean in the big picture? We covered the first three churches last week. We covered Ephesus, which is the, the Ephesus means desirable. And that was a time of the apostolic church in, in, the, in the historical context. Uh, sorry, in the, in the prophetical context, it's the time of the apostolic church, and it went from AD 30 to AD 100, uh, when you know, pretty much John died around AD 95, something like that. Uh, then we have Smyrna, meaning myrrh. Uh, myrrh is a symbol of death, and that was covering the period of uh, 100 to 313 AD, and that was the age of the Roman persecution. And then following on from that, we had Pergamum, a meaning thoroughly married. And that was the age of Constantine, when Christianity was the state religion, the so state and church were thoroughly married, thoroughly intertwined. And that began in AD 313, and it goes down to AD 600. And tonight, we're going to look at the next church, which is, here it comes, Thyatira. Thyatira, and we find this in chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. Verse 18 says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like unto burnished brass. I know thy works, and thy love, and faith, and ministry, and patience, and that thy last works are more than the first. So the destination in verse 18 is Thyatira means continual or perpetual sacrifice. And in the historic prophetic interpretation, it becomes a very good description of the church of the dark ages as seen in the Roman Catholic doctrine of the continual sacrifice in the mass. Now, in Roman Catholic theology, when the priest consecrates the wafer and the cup, they are said to become the real body and the real blood of Messiah through transubstantiation. And so what we're seeing is Messiah is continually being re-sacrificed. And the lay folk, the, the, the ordinary folk within the, within the church were only given the wafer and they were refused the cup. Why? Because they believe that if they if they if they had the cup, they might spill it, and that would be spilling the real blood of Christ. So couldn't give them the cup. Cup was for the clergy alone. Not sure what they're doing today. I haven't been to a Catholic church for a very long time. So we have the distinction here between the clergy and the laity, and we saw earlier on that was the Nicolaitans started that. And now it's come to fruition in, this, in, in the period of AD, the Dark Ages, 600 onwards. In verse 18, what do we have next? We have the description of Jesus. It says, These things says the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like unto burnished brass. So these are symbols of judgment. And they take us right back to chapter 1 of Revelation, verses 14 to 15. And the title, <coughs> the Son of God, is also relevant it's relevant to the pagan society of, of that day, uh, the day in John's day. Why? Because they regarded both Caesar and Apollo as sons of gods, or sons of God. 
but Jesus, or sons of God, sorry, pagan gods. But Jesus is the only, he's the one and only son of God. He is above all other little g gods. So the city, the city here uh, in, in uh, Thyatira, it, it, uh, it boasted a special temple to Apollo, the sun god, S-U-N god, which also explains why the Lord introduced himself as the son of God. And in verse 19, we have a commendation. I know thy works and thy love and faith and ministry and patience and that thy last works are more than the first. So, at least they have a commendation. They're commended for their works, love, faith, ministry, and patience. And that these works were actually increasing. And these guys at the Thyatiran church in, in, uh, in, in John's day were characterized by good works, and so their external appearance was positive. So they get the good news first, but now comes the bad news. The bad news. Here is their condemnation. We see in verse 20 to 23. Uh, and remember what we're talking about. It, it, there were physical churches in John's day, historical churches, but in the sweep of the prophetic history, they fit a time period as well where one particular type of church would dominate. In verse 20 to 23, we have the condemnation. But I have this against thee, that thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, and she teacheth and seduceth my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time that she should repent, and she willeth not to repent of her fornication. In verses 20 to 21, the condemnation involves the tolerance of a woman who is named Jezebel. There could have actually been a woman by that name in the local church at Thyatira, but it's highly unlikely because the name Jezebel is a Phoenician name. And by this time, the Phoenicians had disappeared as a separate ethnic identity, and they've actually become part of the Greek speaking world. It's like today, very few people would be naming their, their daughters Alexa because of oh, one of those, I think it's Amazon. Another thing here, is that Thyatira was not located in Phoenicia, but Thyatira was actually in Asia Minor, uh, which is today's Turkey. So a statement like this uh, gives uh, credence to the historical prophetical interpretation. As well as that, we find in the scriptures that whenever a woman is used symbolically, she represents a religious entity. And this could be either a positive or a negative. On the positive side, there's Israel. Israel is the wife of Jehovah. And uh, you and I, part of the church, we are the bride of Messiah. So we're the bride of Messiah, the church. But on the negative side, uh, there is the woman we saw back in, in, in uh, Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 33, who had the, the, three, the three measures of meal with 11 remembering that leaven was false doctrine. So she had three measures of meal with leaven in it. And then we see in, in we get, well, we will see in, in Revelation 17, we're going to see the great harlot. And here in, in this chapter, in, in chapter two here, we see the woman Jezebel. So this is most likely a reference to the Old Testament Jezebel to describe the state of the church in Thyatira. And just previously last week, we had another Old Testament person, Balaam, uh, who was previously used in describing the church of Pergamum. Um, two more slides will give you some more information on this. We'll just finish this one off first. In verses 22 to 23, there's a description of the judgment on Jezebel. Verse 22, chapter 2, verse 22. Behold, I cast her into a bed, and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of her works. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts, and I'll give unto each one of you according to your works. So Jezebel 
in Thyatira is the Roman Catholic Church within Christendom of the Dark Ages. And we're going to show you why. In verse 22, the woman is to be cast into the great tribulation. Uh, and this means that unlike the true church, the Roman Catholic Church will go into the great tribulation and will play a role during that time. As part of her judgment, the Roman Catholic Church will be cast into the tribulation period. So this is another example of a passage that simply cannot be limited to a local situation. Why, Why do I say that? Because if there really was a specific woman named Jezebel in Thyatira, she would by now be long dead, and therefore she would not be cast into the Great Tribulation, because it hasn't happened yet. But this prophecy is very specific. It says that she and her children will be cast into it. So only if Jezebel is representative of a system can this be true. And again, when a woman is used symbolically, it symbolizes a religious system or entity. In verse 23, the children of, of Jezebel, who, who are they? They're the adherents of the Roman Catholic Church, and they will suffer physical violence and death as part of God's judgment on Jezebel. Now we have the exhortation, verses 24 to 25. But, I, but to you I say, to the rest that are in Thyatira, as many as have not this teaching, who know not the deep things of Satan, as they are wont to say, I cast upon you none other burden. Nevertheless, that which you have, hold fast till I come. So the exhortation involves those who are not part of the Jezebel system and do not know the deep things of Satan. Here, the Roman Catholic Church must be viewed as Satan's counterfeit. And the exhortation is to those who are not involved in Satan's counterfeit. Uh, they're told to hold fast to that which is pure. They're told to hold fast to the New Testament truth uh, over against the Roman Catholic Church system. Uh, I'm going to show you why we're saying this. While this may not sound like a, a major obligation, in the context of the Dark Ages, it certainly was because it took tremendous courage and energy to, to withstand this because the Roman Catholic Church dominated. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church were the ones who installed kings and, and pulled down kings and countries. The popes, they just dominated. Verses 26 to 29 comes the promise. And it's twofold, this promise. It says, he that overcometh and he that keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to shivers, as I also have received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. First, the one overcoming will have a part in the messianic kingdom. And this is in contrast to the false authority of the Roman Catholic Church. They will have true authority over the nations during the messianic kingdom. And remember that you and I, as the bride of Christ, we are going to co-rule with Christ over the nations in the kingdom. Okay. Secondly, they'll have the morning star. And we have another figure used in the book of Revelation. But we then need to speculate what it means. Because in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, the Messiah himself is declared to be the morning star. So it says here that these guys who don't hold to the teachings of Jezebel will possess the Messiah. And the possession of the true faith presupposes a possession of the person of the Messiah. Okay, next one. Jezebel. A bit of a background on Jezebel for those of you who've forgotten. Jezebel was a Sidonian princess, and she became the wife of 
king of, of the wife of Ahab, the king of Israel. And we see that back in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 9 to 23. Now, Ahab was not a good king. He was the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. She was responsible for introducing a pagan religion into Israel that surpassed all the previous sins of idolatry in the northern kingdom. Idolatry in the northern kingdom began with Jeroboam the first. He was the first king. After Solomon died, there was a split. Judah, northern kingdom. Jeroboam the first became the first king of the northern kingdom. But there is a difference between the sins of Jeroboam and the sins of Baal worship. Baal worship was introduced by Jezebel. Baal was the god of the Phoenicians, and she brought it down when she married Ahab. She brought it in. She introduced it. Ahab, a weak man that he was, he said, oh, fantastic. We'll do that. So the sins of Jeroboam the first were simply a, a, a corruption of the true religion. Jeroboam set up a golden calf in, in Dan and in Bethel. But these golden calves that he set up, they represented the God that brought them out of the land of Egypt. Uh, and so this, this was idolatry, but it was a corruption of the true Jehovah worship. And we see this in 1 Kings 12, 25 to 33. And, and also Jeroboam could actually cite a precedent in the worship of the golden calf built by Aaron. Back in Exodus, Exodus, Exodus 32 verse 4, his, his words concerning the golden calf in 1 Kings 12, 28 are actually a quotation of Aaron's words in Exodus 32, 4. So what Jeroboam did, Jeroboam installed the golden calves. They were still worshiping Jehovah, but through these golden calves, because I said the golden calf was what delivered us out of Egypt. It was Jehovah. However, it was a corruption. Jezebel, it wasn't simply a corruption of the true religion, but it was a whole new God and a whole new system of worship which she introduced into Israel. And through Jezebel, Baal worship came into the land and it resulted in, in more idolatry than ever before. And involved in the worship of Baal, was sexual immorality and in the actually with the Baal it was it was sexual immorality in a massive scale in the corruption of Jehovah worship on the Jeroboam uh, morality was still present but in the worship of Baal there was total immorality and Jezebel she then became a very real picture of what the Roman Catholic Church evolved into during the period of the Dark Ages. The Roman Catholic Church introduced a paganism that resulted in idolatry and spiritual fornication. And it became a new religious system bearing very little resemblance to the New Testament church. And I'll show you why. It was during this period that 10 false doctrines were introduced into the church. First of all, we had justification by works, not simply by faith. We were all justified, we were all saved by faith alone, faith plus nothing. But they introduced works as well. Secondly, they introduced baptismal regeneration. What does that mean? It means that a person is saved by baptism. All they're going to do is baptize a person and they're saved. That's what they brought in. Thirdly, it brought in the worship of images. You know, any Roman Catholic church will have all these statues and stuff. Fourth, celibacy. What, that, what is that? It means that they, they forbid priests to marry. And again, here's a further distinction between the clergy and the laity, between the priest and the non-priest. And they also brought in confessionalism. Uh, and what's that? That means that the sins, that sins are confessed to a priest who then declares absolution of those sins sixth thing they brought in was a thing called purgatory purgatory is a place of confinement which is neither heaven nor hell but a place where uh, this is what they brought in it's not biblical 
but it's a place where one has to be refined before going into heaven. So what they're saying is that sanctification was not complete at, at death. Seventh, they brought in the, this, this transubstantiation. And that's the concept of the continual and perpetual sacrifice of the Messiah. That's when, the, when, when, the, when they bless the, 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 uh, the, the bread and, and the wine, they believe it turns into the real blood, the real body of Christ. They also brought in a thing called indulgences. And, and what's that? It means that through the giving of money, a person's time in purgatory, which is not biblical, could be reduced. It's a good money spinner. Ninth, they brought in a thing called penance. And penance involving the torment of the body in order to reduce one's time in purgatory, that might believe place. And tenth, they brought in a, a system called Mariolatry. Mariolatry. What's that? It's the worship of the Virgin Mary. Her elevation as the mother of God and the declaration of her deity. So all of these, all of these things that they brought in, this led to idolatry and spiritual fornication. And this bears no resemblance to the New Testament church. It's a different system. It's a counterfeit. Okay. Let's move on to Sardis. This is in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and thou art dead. Be thou watchful and establish the things that remain which were ready to die. For I have found no works of thine perfected before my God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and didst hear and keep it and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. But thou hast a few names in Sardis that did not defile their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh shall thus be, shall thus be arrayed in white garments, and I will in no wise blot his name out of the book of life, and I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Itchy nose. Destination, verse 1. Sardis. So this Sardis, it means those escaping. And in the historic prophetic interpretation, what does it represent? It represents the church of the Reformation, which began back in 1517 with a man called Martin Luther when he denied his 95 theses to the, to the door of the church. And it ended in 1648 with the signing of the Peace of Westphalia. It ended 1648, right about 1700. Then comes a description. This is a description of Christ. These things says he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This goes back to Revelation 1, verse 4, verse 16, and verse 20. What the description is saying here, that Christ has the fullness of the Holy Spirit as over against this particular church, as we shall see. This particular church is without the Spirit. And in verse 4 comes a commendation. But thou hast a few names in Sardis that did not defile their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So the commendation is for those escaping. That's the meaning of the, of the word sardis, those escaping. Their garments are undefiled and white. So it means that these are the ones who have exercised faith and they have spiritual life and they have overcome the deadness of the church. So there are individuals in all these state churches who are true believers and they've gone because reformation we'll soon see i'll show you shortly they became the state churches 
and these these state churches these these individuals within these state churches they're true believers and they have gone beyond mere doctrinal creeds and have actually accepted the lord jesus and they're living what those creeds actually were moving towards and now they're commended for it but there's a condemnation also in verse one and the condemnation in verse one is this i know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and thou art dead so the main point of condemnation is that they have a name that lives the name says that they live they have a name that lives but they're really dead and this is a valid description of the church of the reformation as it developed over its stages they had a name that lived the reformation resulting in in a in a in, in a lot of a doctrinal correction and it, and it brought some fantastic creeds some really good creeds much of the wrong done and the doctrines brought in by the roman catholic church were corrected by the reformation uh, next slide we're going to search some more information but what corrupted pergamum was the unity of the state and church and it also now corrupts sardis so remember uh, uh, um, um, pergamum were thoroughly married to the state the church was thoroughly married to the state now because of the existence of state churches um, children who were born in a, in a given locality were simply baptized and by this means became members of the church this is in the, in the reformation period personal faith had little or nothing to do with becoming a member of the church you were simply baptized as an infant and you became part of the church that's that particular um, denomination so in a matter of time what happens to the church the greater part of the church becomes composed of unbelievers they're just being baptized into the church the churches all had good solid creeds except that they were still bound to a replacement theology creeds are, 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 are what they believe what they profess to believe um, you know the anglican church we believe in god the father you know those who come out of an anglican background will know what i'm talking about so what it what what we see here it, it, is that it appeared that they were living churches but they were actually dead spiritually dead there was no spiritual life because of a lack of personal faith and a great part of each church was composed of unbelievers and even to this day there are state churches in europe which have good doctrinal creeds but they're composed of people who are spiritually dead verses two to three we have the exhortation be thou watchful and establish the things that remain which were ready to die for I have found no works of thine perfected before my God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and didst hear and keep it and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I'll come upon thee. So the exhortation to them is this. Resurrect that which is about to die. In the first generation of the reformation the people had the spirit of god but the second generation who came into the church merely by infant baptism no longer had it and so the churches were dying spiritually even though the creeds were still sound this is pretty pretty similar to the ephesian church first generation of believers really strong the apost apostolic boys next generation not as strong secondly second in the exhortation they're told to remember like the church at ephesus how it was in the beginning what they had received and what they had heard in the first days of their christian experience now the first generation of the reformation they were fervent in following the leading of the spirit but as time went on eventually they just fell away drifted away the third thing he says in the exhortation is this if they do not become spiritually alive 
their deadness will result in Christ coming to them totally unexpectedly. And as unbelievers, they're going to be left behind. So how do they, come, how do they become spiritually alive? Place their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior from the penalty of their sin. So the promise now to the saddest church is found in verses 5 to 6 of Revelation 3. And we see three things. He says, He that overcometh shall thus be arrayed in white garments, and I will no, in no wise blot his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. First, it says they're going to have white garments. And the symbol used here is explained in a different part of, the, of, of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, it states, And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, white garments are a symbol of salvation. So the first promise to those escaping is salvation. Because for them, the good doctrine is not dead, but it's alive in the Messiah. So they're escaping from that dead church and, they, and they're believing in the Messiah. And those sound creeds, their sound doctrines are alive in them because they're alive in Messiah. Second promise is that their names will not be blotted out of the book of life. And this promise involves their salvation. And it means that their salvation will be eternally secure. It will not be blotted out because their names will remain in the book of life forever. It's a promise here of eternal security. Then the third thing, the name of the believer will be confessed by the Messiah before God the Father and before his angels. Okay, so that's Sardis. Now, the Reformation churches. The different churches developing in the Reformation, they had good creeds and they had solid biblical doctrine. But they were dead. They became dead. There was no spiritual vitality. They became dead because they failed to rectify the basic problem, which was the unity of church and state. After they broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, they too became state churches. In Germany and Scandinavia, we have the Lutheran Church became the state church. In England, we had the Anglican Church and we had the Church of England. In Scotland, we had the Presbyterian Church. In one part of Switzerland, we had the Calvinist or Reformed Church. And in another part of Switzerland, we had Zwingli. Not a very big part, Zwingli. So the Reformation failed to correct the problem of church and state unity. Therefore, it eventually became a dead church. Okay. Now we have the number six church, the Philadelphia, the church of the great missionary movement. We see this in, in verses 7 to 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and none shall shut, and that shuts and none open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you a door opened which none can shut, that you have a little power and did keep my word and did not deny my name. Behold, I give of the synagogue of Satan, of them that say they are Jews and they are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you did keep the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, that hour which is to come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I come quickly. Hold fast that which you have, that no one take your crown. He that overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and she shall go out thence no more. 
and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and mine own new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here we have the destination of the church. It's the, the Philadelphian church. Verse 7. And Philadelphia means brotherly love. And in the historic prophetic interpretation, it is a fitting symbol of the church during the great missionary movement from 1700 down to 1900. And this was a period of great missionary names such as Hudson Taylor, Adoram Judson, and, and many others. And here it becomes a fitting title of the church of the great missionary movement that began around about 1700 and continued to the turn of the last century around 1900. Next, we have a description of Jesus in the second part of verse 7. These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and none shall shut and that shutteth, and none openeth. Last part of verse 7 is taken from Isaiah 22.2, where authority was given to was given God's servant, Eliakim, over David's house. And just as Christ has authority over his church, just as Jesus has authority of the church, Eliakim, uh, back in Isaiah 22, verse 22, was given authority over David's house. And this description of Jesus takes us back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. It pictures Jesus, it pictures Christ as having the key by which he can both open and by which he can shut. Key opens doors, closes doors. So in the case of this particular great missionary movement, the door was open so that they could go in. And this is the second church that Christ has nothing against. The first one was Smyrna. And so what we see here is that there is no condemnation over this particular church. Instead, the text moves on to the commendation in chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Jesus says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee a door open which no one can shut that thou hast a little power, and thou didst keep my word, and didst not deny my name. So the, com com the commendation is in verse 8. And they're commended for making use of the open door. It's the Messiah himself who opened the door, and the Philadelphians were faithful in making the use of it. Philadelphians, the brotherly love church, they made use of that open door. And during the period of 1700 to 1900, there was virtually no place in the world where a missionary could not go. Every place was open to them. Today, uh, very few countries are, are open to Christian missionaries. In fact, most of them are closing their doors to Christian, Christian missionaries. But during those two centuries, there were virtually no door, there was no limitation, and this church took advantage of it. They had a little power. Why? Because it was the minority of the church who were supporting these missionaries. Yet the little power was used to accomplish fantastic things, great things, and they're commended for it. And the promise to the church is found in verses 9 to 10 and verses 12 to 13. And it's four, four promises here. Verse 9 to 10. Behold, I give of the synagogue of Satan, of them that say they are Jews, and they are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou didst keep the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of trial, that hour which is to come upon the whole world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no one take thy crown. 
And the promise continues in verses 12 to 13. He that overcometh, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out thence no more. And I'll write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God and mine own new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Philadelphian church had some tremendous promises given to them here. And, and, and remember, uh, that, uh, the Philadelphian church is the church of the believers. Uh, we're part of the Philadelphian church. It's, it's the church of the believers that is going to exist up to the point of the rapture of the church. The next church, which we're going to see is the Laodicean church, we, we're going to see in that is, an, is a totally unsaved church, and they will remain in their entirety behind. Yeah. What are the promises given to the Philadelphian church? First of all, in verse 9, they're promised fruit from those who claim to be Jews or the people of God, and they're not. It is still the period described by uh, Hosea. Hosea is, is one of the 12, is one of the minor prophets. In Hosea uh, chapter 1, verse 8 to 9, and chapter 2, verse 23, uh, Hosea is describing when Israel is on the sideline of God's program and considered to be not my people. But in the future, they will again become my people. And we see this in, in Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, to chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 5. Now, it's interesting to note here that it is during this time, in, in this time period, when Jew in, in the in the in uh, um, 1700 to 1900, it's when Jewish missions actually came into its own, uh, and and by 1900, some 250,000 Jews came to faith in the Messiah. And Jewish missions first began in Germany, and then they took root in England, and then finally they shifted across to the United States. And it, it was a uh, it was a time when many of the natural branches were being regrafted into their own olive tree. However, it's more likely that this verse here deals more literally with those who claim to be Jews, but they're not. And this is also the period that saw the rise of cults. For instance, we have Mormonism. Back in this period, this is when the cults started to rise up. We had Jehovah Witnesses, we had Christian scientists and others. And one common element among them is to claim to be the real Jews by claiming to be the 144,000 Jews, which we're going to see in chapter 7, or the 10 lost tribes of Israel. And that, that's their claim. Nevertheless, the, the Philadelphian church are going to win converts among these guys as well. The second promise is in verse 10. Uh, the promise is that they will not go into the great tribulation period. So this church is promised deliverance from the great tribulation period. The Jezebel element in the Thyatira church will go through the tribulation, but the church of Philadelphia will not. This is not a promise that can be limited to Philadelphia or at all, since this church has long passed away. So it's not a promise just for the, the, the historic Philadelphian church because they're gone. This is a promise for the church at large. Uh, and this, again, this, this fact here um, gives support for the historic prophetic interpretation. And in this passage, the church is promised to be kept from the period of trial that is about to fall upon the whole world. And in the context of the book of Revelation, it's the tribulation. And we're going to see that in chapters 6 to chapter 19. And that's the period of trial that is to fall upon the whole earth. And it is from this period of trial that the church is to be kept. Now, this verse does not say that the church will be merely kept safe during the trial. It says it will be kept from the very hour of the trial, that is, from the very time of it. It won't be there. 
Why won't it be there? Because this church will be removed before the tribulation ever occurs. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, it means only that the church, sorry, if Revelation 3, 10 means only that the church will be kept safe during the tribulation, then something goes terribly wrong because we're going to see that throughout the tribulation, saints are being killed on a massive scale. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, in, verse, in chapter 11, verse 7, in chapter 12, verse 11, and, and chapter 13, verses 17 and 15, chapter 14, verse 13, chapter 17, verse 6, chapter 18, verse 24. Saints are being killed right through the, the tribulation period. And if, this, if these saints that are being killed during the tribulation period are church saints, well, they're not being kept safe. And then if that's the case, then Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 means nothing. Only if church saints and tribulation saints are kept distinct, let's say distinct, they're separate. Church saints are those who are in Messiah, those who are in the Christ, in Christ, in the body of Messiah. And, and, and uh, tribulation saints are those who come to faith after the body of Messiah is gone, after the rapture. Uh, if if we, we need to keep the church saints and tribulation saints as distinct, if we keep them distinct, then the promise of, Re of Revelation 3.10 makes sense. Then it makes sense. The third promise in verse 12, first part, is that they will serve as a pillar in the temple of God. So on one hand, this could be a, a reference to being a part in the temple of God as, as seen in the invisible church, because that's who we are, the temple of God. On the other hand, it may also refer to the millennial temple during the messianic age. The fourth promise, second part of verse 12, is that they will have on them three new names. The name of God, the name of Jerusalem, and the new name of the Messiah. And we see the exhortation in verse 11. It is simply for them to continue to do as they are doing, for they're doing a good job. So this is the second church for which there is no condemnation. Smyrna, like Smyrna, Messiah finds nothing against this church and he's satisfied with this church. This is the church where, and as we said before, the Philadelphian church just goes right up until the rapture. So we are in the mix of this Philadelphian church. Now, almost there. It's interesting to note that during uh, this time when Jewish missions came into being, did I tell you this before? I did. This is just the this is just uh, backing up what I what I spoke about before. We see Jewish missions flourishing in this time. Two hundred fifty thousand come to faith. You know that in Israel today there's, there's, there's maximum twenty thousand maximum twenty thousand Jewish believers in Messiah. Um, there's not many around the world. But back in this day, 250,000 came to faith. And we see the rise of the cults, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian science, all those, all those mob. Okay. That, my friends, is the end for you tonight. Um, I, I didn't want to go into uh, the, the Laodicean church because um, there's a lot in the Laodicean church and I wouldn't have time to finish it all tonight. I want to finish... I want to do the latest in church next week and we'll see about the, the apostasy and things like that next week. So study hard, grow strong. And, uh, ooh, hang on. If you want to contact me, here we go. Any questions, email uh, those. Uh, these sessions are recorded and they're put onto our RL Ministries Australia YouTube channels. So if you miss anything, you can go back and listen to those. Um, and we have Facebook as well.